Hi, everyone. My name is Olivier Dion. I work at EFCS. And today, we'll be talking about the challenge of implementing a user space tracer, tracer more specifically about uh, the challenge that we have encountered in LTTNG. So here's a summary. I will just briefly introduce uh, what we talk about challenges, some definition. Then I will speak about uh, the challenge of shared resources between the tracer and the runtime. Then I will present uh, some problem that we have with shared resources between the tracer and external processes. And then some other challenges and then a conclusion. So we have more than a decade of experience solving problems uh, with tracers in user space. We had a lot of feedbacks from users, and we would like to share the, this with you. Um, so yeah, so challenge of integrating a user space tracer in the Linux ecosystem more specifically, uh, and all of these can be applied to other tools and application also. It's not specific to tracers. So uh, the user space tracer property trifecta. So we have like three um, property that we want to have for user space tracer. The first is the integrity of application. So this will be denoted as I for the rest of uh, the talk. So for example, you don't crash the application. You don't corrupt the application data. And you have a predictable timing impacts on real time applications. So you don't have missed deadline, for example. Uh, and this is in uh, decreasing order. So really, the integrity is like the most uh, high pr property that the tracer must have. Then came the, the reality of result, denoted as R. It, uh, for example, um, if you discard event as a tracer, you should report it to the user. So the user doesn't think that no event was emit or it doesn't reach a branch. It's really like you have discarded the event. Um, other example is report the tracing setup complete or partial failure. So the, the, trace, uh, the, the user understand what's happening in the tracer and it's reliable. And then the third uh, property is the adaptability of the tracer. So they know that's A, um, automatically adapt to the software and hardware environment and minimize the amount of user intervention to configure the tracer. So, you know, auto detection of, of things. So we can represent this as a Venn diagram. And when, for example, we miss uh, the integrity part, which is the most in important part for a tracer, uh, you get uh, the user distrust the tracer. It will not deploy it. If you uh, lack uh, reality, instead, the, the, the result will be doubted by the user. And if you lack adaptability, then you increase the burden put on the user because he has to put more configuration. So that was the introduction. Now we'll be talking about the problem related to shared resource between the tracer and runtimes. So for memory usage, the problem that we can have is that, um, well, the tracer is like a sub-program in the program itself. And so it will have an impact on the memory layout. For example, uh, we had some problem, I think, with some users that could observe a double free by the application, not the tracer. The application was actually doing the double free, was not getting the error, but because the tracer is now there, because the, the memory access pattern has changed, the double free could appear. And the user will report it as a bug from the tracer, which is not. But really, because you introduce something else in the program, you have no, an observable effect when you're tracing. And of course, you're, you're, you're changing the reprodu reproductivity of memory access pattern of the application. So it might be more difficult to reproduce bugs because of changing of access patterns. Um, this is actually a problem for us in LTTNG is that we cannot um, guarantee a quiescent state using p trade ad forks. So if you fork a process, LTTNG has to um, remove some memory but it has to be in a quiescent state to get an overall picture of what's have to be free in the, the fork. Um, but this is not can be done right now with ptrade.fork because of the implementation in glibc. Uh, you could have a, a, a thread of LTTNG that's doing a malloc or a free and will endlessly, endlessly loop. So we will, you, will, you will never reach the quiescent state that you want. Um, and this is necessary to get the rendezvous point for LTTNG, listener threads. So our current solution to improve the integrity of the application is to LD preload a, a wrapper, it's LTTNG with the fork. Um, and this will help us to uh, 
to basically bypass the betrayed ad fork problems. And the future solution to increase the adaptability of the tracer is to implement our own memory allocator within LTTNG instead. So we don't have this problem of sharing memory allocation, allocation with the, the application itself. If we talk about file descriptor table now, and the problem is that single traded application, for example, daemon, can cause all file descriptors. This is a recurrent pattern, okay? But the tracer needs to communicate with external process via Unix circuit, for example. This is what the LTNG listener thread does. And so either two things can happen. Uh, either the tracer will fail to write or write, uh, read or write to its file descriptor, so the communication would be lost with external processes. That's actually the good thing. The bad thing that would happen is that the application will open the file descriptor and LTNG is not notified about it and so now the tracer write to the application file descriptor and you corrupt data. And this is actually probably a similar problem that prevents glibc of using IO uring, okay? If glibc has to keep a file descriptor globally inside of it and then the application try to close it and glibc, well glibc probably could be notified about it since it's basically the runtime, but you get the gist. It's a similar problem for other use cases. So our current solution to get this integrity of file descriptor table is to, like for the memory, is to LD preload a, a, a wrapper around some uh, system call and also a libc call. And this will prevent close all behavior on tracer file descriptors. So we can actually like prevent closing our file descriptor from the application. But as a future solution for adaptability, well, we could simply uh, clone the listener thread in, into a different file descriptor table. So the, the application and the tracer threads doesn't share the same file descriptor table. Um, problem with single handling also. So single handler, uh, number could be used by the application. So if your tracer is expected to use that single number or maybe every POSIX single number has been used by the application. So what do you do if you rely on that for IPC? You can't. Uh, and there's also problem with starvation of single FD. If, you, if the, tra uh, the application is expecting to have a single FD and you could starve it. So our solution for that is do not rely on single for IPC and we block all signals. So this uh, solved the problem of uh, signal number, the first one, and the second one of blocking all signal prevent the starvation problems. Uh, for locks, so this is a very specific case that we had in LTTNG, is that um, there was a problem of deadlock caused by uh, dependency chain, and this was actually fixed in glibc 2.24 recently. Basically, uh, there was a, an inverse locking and between the tracer and the dynamic loader and so it was just deadlocking the application so the current solution is to ensure some consistent locking order so this required some uh, cumbersome logic but a possible solution will be uh, to protect the dynamic loader structure with RCU for example do not rely on lock to prevent a deadlock or use reference counter for those st structures. And, and then we have a resource management after a fork. So um, the resource that the, the tracer allocated in the application can be leaked in the child process if there's no XD. So uh, memory and open file descriptors, typically. So our current solution is to also use the same LD preload uh, wrappers around fork clone and other syscall and libc function to ensure that we uh, free this memory. So this is why uh, we were talking about the quiescent state early on, is that we need to have a global picture of what's been allocated in the parent and free it in the child, since there may be or maybe not an exit V that will rip that memory. And the future solution to improve the adaptability, because now, you know, the, the user has to LD preload every time uh, its application with these wrappers, and this can be cumbersome, you, you know, you put a burden on the, the users. So the future solution will be to use p at fork instead to get callbacks when there's a fork, but this requires own memory allocator, like I explained earlier. And then there's transparent and multi-trading. So the problem is that uh, some application assume that it's single traded, okay? And for example, global stack like UMask, you cannot change UMask in the, the tracer 
because the application is not expecting it to change. So our solution to that is to fork a worker process. So we have a child and we send command to the child and the child do the UMass for us. Now I'm going to talk about shared resources uh, with, between the tracer and external processes. And so the problem is that um, in, at least in LTTNG, uh, the uh, inter-process uh, communication must be done over shared memory per UID. So every application under that UID share the same memory. And this must be resilient with respect to application termination. And this is a hard problem. And so what we have is that uh, we have a three-step protocol. We reserve the memory in the ring buffer, then we write, and then we update the copy, uh, the commit, sorry, the commit counters. And so when a consumer consumes the ring buffer, we can determine if this, the reserve and the commit is in balance. However, um, yeah, if an application terminates between the reserve and the commits, there's no easy way for the, um, the consumer to determine if it's just the process that has stopped, for example, is being debugged or doing something else, or it has crashed. And so we could ask the question, why not use TLS-based ring buffer instead of pure CPU, pure UID uh, ring buffers? Well, uh, that doesn't scale very well with uh, frequent and short lifetime thread, which was a customer requirement we'd, we had in the past. And there's also a lot of allocation and publication overhead associated with if you have short lifetime threads, you have to allocate a new TLS and then you have to publish it to external processes every time. So our current solution to have reliable tracing, we recommend to use the per PID ring buffers instead because then we know that the, if the application crash, we can just rip off this ring buffer entirely, right? There's no problem of sharing memory with other processes uh, under this UID. But we would like to, as a future solution, to improve reliability and adaptability, well, is to introduce the notion of sub-buffer producer ownership. So the ring buffer has multiple sub-buffer, and if you have two producer, they cannot have multiple producer at the same time in a sub-buffer. Instead, it will skip to the next sub-buffer, and the ownership is like a tag that we put on the sub-buffer, and we have a, a whole algorithm for that, that allows a consumer to detect stalled processes versus terminated owner. And now for other challenges. So for example, there's CPU topology in containers. The problem is that, um, well, if you allocate ring buffers for every CPU in the containers, but your containers only use a subset of the CPU, then you're over allocating memory for nothing. Um, and so the current state right now is to use an adaptive per CPU allocation uh, based on RSEC concurrency level, uh, MMCID in the kernel, but it's not the malware for now. The future solution to improve adaptability is to have adaptive per CPU allocation over shared memory that's new malware, and that's, uh, the idea is like for the IPC namespace. Another challenge is limited IO CPU time and persistent storage, for example, uh, when resources are scarce for embedded system. Uh, the current solution is to use uh, dynamic filtering to reduce the amount of trace generated, snapshot, <coughs> so using a flight recorder, or triggers. Uh, the future solution also that we are currently working on is to implement trace at counters. So it's, it allows to, you know, uh, do aggregation of data instead of uh, having a huge trace, you just have counters that have been incremented and then you can have an uh, histograms. Um, and then there's also structured instrumentation in runtime other than C. So what if you want to instrument Python, Golang, Java, JavaScript, other than C and C++? Well, the future solution is to use Lipside by presented by Mathieu. As for the conclusion, well, this, these are the reference, basically. And any questions? Questions? I do have one thing I want to point out about the um, 
ring buffer over IPC and the algorithm for handling application crashes at uh, any point within the uh, reserve commit algorithm. So, I mean, you, you, you discussed uh, previously that uh, this presentation is, yes, focusing on tracing, but it's some of the, the ideas can be applicable to other areas. I'm thinking about databases that may want to exchange information across shared memory between processes for resiliency concerns and things like that. So these type of kind of uh, transaction-based algorithms might be interesting in other areas than tracing. So I'm open to ideas and discussion about that. Questions? Yes. So you mentioned that you can't use TLS ring buffers due to short list threads. Um, if your application mostly has long list threads, could there be like a, or some ring buffers that maybe you recycle and use the first time you see a thread, it uses one of these ring buffers and as long as you don't have too many of them, uh, like would that be something that maybe it would be configurable? that some applications may benefit, that they have a limited number of threads or they have, uh, I don't know, a small number of threads and maybe this TLS ring buffer would work for them. I understand it cannot work in, in general, but uh, is there interest in making it available for applications that could use TLS ring buffers? So my concern about uh, doing that is that when you share those buffers with a consumer daemon, that is an external process that needs to grab a handle on those buffers and consume the data and everything. So even if you have this scheme where you kind of recycle those ring buffers, you still need to publish them to the consumer daemon so it's aware that it needs to consume them. So you have extra communication whenever a buffer needs to be handed over. So it may not require allocation, but there's still a communication round trip. So, yeah. So you, you have a big part still of the overhead that's required. And you may not recycle it before the consumer the daemon has completed reading it out and pushing it out. That adds also some constraints. Other questions? Thank you. Thanks.